Madam Chair, Ms. Heather Gray, Mr. Rodney Pigott, President of the Tobago Writers Guild, library staff, uh, distinguished persons like Mr. Reginald Dumas, Dr. Vanus James, and everybody else in the room, everybody is distinguished. Good evening. I would like to thank the Tobago's Writers Guild for inviting me to be part of this very important exercise. I want to say that I agreed to take what I thought was a very simple topic. But then people keep asking, well, precisely what this topic is going to be about. I thought it was clear. So what I propose to do is, when well, you see the topic, law, environment, and society in Tobago since 1962. So the first question I have was 1962. The hurricane happened in 1963. However, in history, one of the things you learn is that there are always predisposing factors. So we have to start before the actual event. So what I did, I used the Copico as a metaphor for Tobago. So we're looking at Tobago through the lens of the Coquico. They have um, parallels in their experiences. Um, very similar things happen, and very similar responses also occurred. So the Coquico is Tobagonian, and Tobagonian is Coquico. So, and I would at the end draw my, uh, attention to some matters which I think ought to be addressed. I think everybody knows what the Coquico looks like because it's just everywhere. When I was growing up in Tobago, it was something your father brought home when he went hunting, but you never really saw it flying around. But now, it's just all over. Now, this bird has several names. The scientific name, Ortalis ruficada. Now, the, the, ruf, the rufi and the rufus, uh, they all have to do with the brownish color on the bird. So um, we have a list of names, but the name Coprico is a derivative of what it was called by the first peoples. They, their name for it sort of reflected the sound that they made. And the spelling changed, uh, was changed by writers of the 19th century and planters who occupied Tobago during the 18th, 16th to the 18th century. <laughs> And they also called it the Tobago peasant because it looked much like the pheasants that they were accustomed to hunting. So we just call it Coquico. So it is found, it is native to Tobago and Venezuela, and I think it's also found, some are found in north, northeastern Colombia, in Bequa and Union Island where it was, where the bird was introduced. And it is the only game bird, so this is why it became so popular with hunters. It developed originally in the deep forest areas, and it is a high perch, it stays high up in the trees. The thing about the Kokiku is that originally it lived in a protected environment. It was first protected by the fact that the forest trees were in the hilliest parts of the islands, not really occupied. And therefore, that offered it a, a semblance of protection. But another, another level of protection occurred when the island became a British possession. In 1776, an ordinance was signed by the then governor of Tobago agreeing to maintain a forest reserve for the purpose of attracting rain. So when that preserve was established, the bird's habitat was partially secure, partially because the hunters still used to go, as they still do. All right, so just in case anybody has never seen one, it looks like a common fowl. Um, it doesn't fly long distances. So this is very interesting how it moved from one part of the island to the other. Um, it moves in groups. The groups constitute, at times, two, the family, the, the, the parent, two, or four parents and children, or larger groups 
but the, you, you don't usually see one bird by itself. Well, the characteristic that stands out most about the Kokriku is that it is noisy. It organizes choirs, but they're not sweet. <laughs> you don't want to hear it. And early morning, 4 o'clock, yeah. and late evening. So just when you don't want to hear them, they're there. And particularly after they finish eating, because at those same times, they feed. But what bad as we think the songs are, they court each other. So the male has one pitch and the female has another. And so they, they, they um, call and answer. So you have the call and respond situation that the Calypsonians talk about. So it stays, arboreal means staying high up in the trees. It walks along the branches and so, searches for food. That's when it's in the forest. Fond of fruit and a range of berries, young leaves. But it was known even in the forest to scratch on the ground. Uh, it has been seen eating bread, but this is, this is a, a modern thing. This is the modern cockerel. This is not the old time one. So its nests are built in the lower branches of trees. But there's also something about the nests, because they happily take other people's nests and take it over, put their, put, lay their eggs and, and sit on them, incubate them. The female incubates, sometimes the male is around watching guard, and if, if they feel the nest is threatened, they get extremely aggressive. It, was a, it has been, and I understand still remains, a popular food item. It was hunted by the indigenous peoples, but you know they use slingshots, so that they never hunted large numbers. Um, the planters in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century found um, they were fond of hunting, and the, the, only, the main game that they had to hunt was the cockerel. And then in freedom, the African population um, seeking sustenance, they too turned to hunting. It remained popular after emancipation. And then we have this popular dish, and most people, well, some of them here are too young, would have had Cockrico was stewed down with coconut and dumplings. And that is a traditional fare. If it, if it had, the meat is very, can be very tough because it's a very muscular bird. Uh, because of the activities it does, it unlock the movement. So you might add some purple to soften it. And it is said now, studies out of the University of the West Indies, that the protein content of the flesh of the Cockrico is higher than most of the, the um, protein meats that we consume. It, in those days, the, the, the country was far from the town. Now, we have no distinction. I mean, everywhere is town. But so it was far away. And now it has become a national symbol. Everybody knows what it looks like. There's a drawing on the coat of arms, which I show. But when it became a national bird, there were laws to protect it. After all, you can't have the national birds like swordfish all over the place. So it came under the Conservation of Wildlife Act of 1958, which listed the negative fauna of the island, of, of the country. And the cockroach was not included in that. So it was seen as a positive, nice, positive bird. And so out of that, and the coat of arms, when the coat of arms issue came up in 1962, then we have this bird that is not a pest that would be put on the coast of our, coat of arms. So that was the first law. Now what that did was to reduce some of the hunting. Because by law, it was protected. And there were many speakers talking about these birds and, and, and the good image that they projected of the country, and they should not be hunted. It didn't stop it, but it was reduced. So this gave the population of the bird a chance to increase beyond the normal rate. So the item is proudly strutting on the coat of arms. 
And then, just one year into its elevated status, hurricane flora hits the island. The forest was decimated, and therefore and the crops around. So the bird lost its habitat and the outlying food source. Now, after Hurricane Flora, so too was agricultural damage, cocoa, bananas, everything was, what wasn't blown down was roasted by the, the, the salt-bearing winds that, that scorch the earth. So, but still, after that, the bird was not on the list of what the farmers would call vermin, that's pests. And subsequent natural disasters have affected the bird and its habitat. So what does the bird do? Things not good, so you leave. So it came out from the forest edge, and then it spread. Because after the hurricane, the areas right around the most forested areas were also very badly damaged. So bird move and move until it reached town. Now, when it reached town, now town was badly damaged too, but also we began to have um, developments happening on Leeward Tobago. And in this new drive of development, people planted fruit trees. So Cockrico find a place to rest its head. So now it adapted and it multiplied. Plenty fruit trees, plenty things to eat. So gardens, everybody where, everywhere somebody had something growing, the birds were there helping themselves. And it became urbanized. So that means it's modern now. When you become urbanized and you're modernized, you change a lot of things. And one of the first things people change is what they eat. You don't want no country bunking food. So you move to the whatever the tongue offers. And so this bird became urbanized and domesticated. It domesticated itself. It came and it stayed in yards. It ate whatever it wanted. It, it sit on whatever nest was available. And you couldn't get rid of them. Now. And not roosting and not making no nests up in the tree if nests are around, or if where the chickens nest in, it will go there. So its residents now move from forest trees to fruit trees. So if you have a pomerac, mango, any, any of any those fruit trees, and then it is raising its families there. So it really is there to stay. So people started having these birds in their backyards not invited, not courted, but they, they're there and raising families like, like, yeah, like yardies. But one thing about them is that if you demonstrated any hostility to them, usually they don't come back. So um, there are stories of people who um, struck one and the rest of the flock left. There are stories of people who put um, things in their trees to chase them and continually pet them, and they, they move next door. So it has become clear, them ain't going nowhere, right here. So now it becomes a pest. So it moved from the elevated status of a national bird and is now a national pest. Because at the same time that the bird is eating down everything you could see, there are attempts to increase the agricultural production post flora. <laughs> so people are complaining. But what do you do with a bird that's national, protected, and pesty? So it was a dilemma. The farmers kept complaining, begging for government action. And the government really didn't act, at least not as fast as people would have liked. So the birds didn't care. Every morning and every evening, they continue singing. The government tried two strategies. They appointed people called pest control officers. And they, they were employed 
to shoot the birds on private property. Uh, they were issued the required ammunition and sent out there. There was supposed to be an arrangement for the disposal of the birds, but I know those birds, whichever ones were shot, end up, ended up in somebody's pot. And then when that didn't work, they tried captive breeding and rearing. So they had people go around and try to collect the eggs to see if they could get chickens to, to incubate them. And you would have this captive stock of birds, which could be used either for the meat or to be released if the, the, the general population of the bird declined. But one thing about the Caprico population, it kept increasing. So there was no captive breeding. They weren't able, some people did raise, a few people did raise some, but, but generally the idea was not popular because people simply did not like the bird. So then the problem is aggravated by subsequent natural disasters. And so the bird population moved into the Liwa Tobago. It remained protected. Um, but we had a situation where there were more Caprico outside of the forest area than inside. So we began to have a national discourse on this Cockrico problem, and several newspapers had headlines, like the one featured there, the Cockrico is killing agriculture. So in 2016, the Wildlife Act was amended, and the bird was not listed in that, in that um, document, but when, when the wildlife policy was articulated, the cockerel was listed as a pest. So you have a national bird, which is now a pest. What do we do with pests? Get rid of them. But it did state that the birds could only be killed on private property without a game license. So if they had them in your yard, you could, cut, you could shoot them and, and, and make your cockerel and dumpling and you would not be charged. If you are to hunt them on state land, you require permission, the, 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 the game license. But the thing is, most of the birds were on private property anyhow, so the law did not even make sense. So now, precisely what is the status of this bird? And what are we going to do with it? Is it a pest? Is it a national bird? Is it still protected? What are we to do? So this constitutes one of the major challenges with which the country has not yet faced. So what are some of the things that we could do? I mean, I have them all in question marks because they are not, by any means, recommendations. They are just ideas we could think about. Should we drop, demote the bird, and drop the national status? The animal lovers might protest that or take the government to court. Should we remove the protection of the bird? Should we follow the lead of the bird and just go and allow wide, um, total widespread um, domestication? Should we make the national bird a tourist food attraction? Can we develop bird communities in some of the, the island dependencies around Tobago? Should we repatriate the bird? And we really at the point where we have to do something because as the Calypso say, the bird pick up something and they run with it. Well, yes, they run with it because they don't fly very much. So that is the bird. It is there, it's problematic, and we have to live with it. People are waiting for solutions. None has been forthcoming. So we're going now and looking at Tobago. Migration is a theme in the history of Tobago. European migration, forced migration of captive Africans, Post emancipation schemes bringing <coughs> immigrants in, immigrated Africans, Grenadians, and time as well, Indian immigrants. And in addition to that, Tobagonians have moved. People have moved from the rural areas. You know, at one time you can tell where people come from by the names, because certain names begin to Charlottesville, to Roxborough, to Mason Hall, to Bonacord, and so on. But now that's not so. People moved in search of opportunities. So like the bird, we have had migration. We've had people migrate to different places, and some of them returned. Trinidad, Cuba, Panama, 
Curacao, Aruba, Guyana, the US, UK. Um, now, the going is one thing, and the coming back is another thing, as I will show later. Like the Copico, Tobago has had multiple names before we settled on Tobago, and we list them there. One group of the indigenous people called it U Europania, another group called it Alubera. And then we have from the Europeans, Bella Forma, and questions about whether it's Crusoe Isle, an island, the assumption, then various um, spellings and pronunciation of Tobago, Tobacco, Tobacco, and so on, depending on our European nationality. The parallel causes are the same, natural disasters, unfavorable circumstances, limited, for example, limited employment opportunities, low wages, lack of education and training facilities, and the difficulties of promotion in the workplace. These are some of the factors that encourage people from Tobago to migrate. After national disaster, just like the bird, agriculture in Tobago was destroyed. And like the bird, we have to get the food from somewhere. So we started importing food. So we moved from being largely food secure to a state of food dependency. I don't know if we have elevated ourselves out of that status as yet. Now, after the hurricane, we had a change on the labor scene because there were many projects to rebuild. So these products provided employment for, more employment for people. Um, special works program, then not only with, was there special works, but with overtime pay. So people, a lot of those were uh, male employees, so there's a lot of money, and what is associated with that? What we have was a disinterest in agriculture. Well, the, the farmers complained. The soil was not yielding, and that is because of the saltiness of the hurricane. That's right after the hurricane. But once you had special works, people felt agriculture was too hard. The agricultural force in Tobago was made up of the older people who 55 and older. And so the next generation wasn't into agriculture. They went into special books, whatever the names were called, 10 days, URP, crash program. The crash program was um, something that was very, very marked in Tobago because it produced the biggest scandal that the island has had in, in the public sector. Because um, money was allocated for various activities, but some people got creative and used it for other purposes, and that did not sit too well with the authorities. So like the bird, the bird, has, the bird migrated, and it changed its eating habits, or its habits generally. So in Tobago, the people did just that. They abandoned the, the old time thing, you know, where your grandmother didn't ah, we don't want them old thing so anymore. They threw them out throughout the practices. Development was um, conceived in people's minds as something where you move from the old time thing into the new time thing. So you, you're either ancient or modern. And so poor people food was old time, them breadfruit and cassava and them stuff, they didn't want that. Um, the little garden and thing, or if you're getting into garden, you must go big and you must use fertilizer. You know, there was a time when um, farmers would put um, food, food scraps into a hole and plant the banana down in the hole. But now we would, the more modern thing was to add fertilizer instead. At, at that time, there was no consciousness that all of this would eventually run off and enter the sea and impact people in a number of other negative ways. But then you also have, and, and every time I, I see an ad on the newspaper, on the media for this new product that does so much for you and it's natural, and it is either in a little bag or in a capsule. And when you check, it's something you have growing here that you could just go outside and pick. For example, I had a friend, I have a friend, and she told me she had a problem. She wasn't sleeping well, so she was going to the doctor. She lived in Barbados. I said, you're going to the doctor because you can't sleep? 
you don't have a sour sap tree in your yard? She said, no, <laughs> she don't have a sour sap. But she had never heard. I said, well, I grew up in where people used to give their baby children that all the time to get them to sleep and keep quiet. Well, now you get to the tea bags. Yes, that, that looks better, more sophisticated, right? <laughs> so the indeterminate st status. So the bird I pointed out is its status is quite indeterminate. So what about Tobago? What is its status? Also in the indeterminate up to this point. Um, we do know some people think we are dependency. Some people want autonomy. Some people think we should shut up and behave ourselves. What are we? A unit? If you start talking to Bego and its problems, somebody will come up and say, that's no different from Toku or, or Los Euros. And I would always say, if you look at the documents, there's no unit called Toku or Los Euros. There are two units, unified. One is Trinidad, one is Tobago. So don't compare Tobago with Toku or Maruka or anywhere else. It's one whole against the other one. Now, this thing uh, um, came up in the discussion about autonomy for Tobago. And talk about the people of Tobago, and people ask, who is a Tobagoian? So, that is something we have to get clear. Because some people see a Tobagoian as somebody who resides in Tobago. So if you reside, resided, if you were born and you resided and you left and you didn't come back, it seems as though in some people's minds your status has been eroded. And there are some people who are Tobagonian, live outside, and would like to make contributions in a variety of ways. But they cannot, because they're not living here. And as far as they perceive, their efforts are not welcome. We have to do something about that. And um, exclusion is never, never a good thing. And if people feel they belong, and they have basis for belonging, I think they should be given a chance. So, the birds, what about the migrant, migrant coquico? They are different to the ones that remain in the rainforest. So, are they both coquicos? Or are the migrant ones somebody else or something else or another bird? So, they both, both the bird and the people have been affected by laws. Um, in the case of Tobago, it's the, the ordinance of 1776 and of setting up the rainforest. Now, that was not popular. Planters were dead set against it. And then 1958 to 63, when everybody was national conscious and you had to have something from Tobago uh, being represented on the emblem, people were happy with that. For Tobago, 1889, 1898, there were a number of people with some reservations. And that final 1898 and the subsequent relationship between Trinidad and Tobago has been affected by the perception in Trinidad that Tobago was a dependency and the proud assertion in Tobago that they had a better historical experience in Trinidad. So that has colored our relations. Change in characteristics. The Tobagonian of yesteryear was a highly valued individual. One, they were considered trustworthy. Two, they were considered reliable. And three, they were considered hardworking. Well, that disappeared to the point where now we look for workers from Trinidad. Not that they are better, but so we have a service, the service from our workforce is decidedly poor. And this is something 
that we have to address. I mean, the country, the island is going nowhere with no autonomy if you do not have a workforce that's reliable. I mean, there are many stories about people's lack of performance. You turn up to work on, on an eight, a, work, a job that goes from eight to four. Many turn up at nine, nine thirty. Many go for lunch. Well, when they come late, they still have to go for breakfast. <laughs> when they go for lunch, they take an hour, go in the mall and do all kinds of things, leave early to pick up the children and get paid for the entire day. There, there was an instance a couple of years ago where a department organized a party. The workers closed the office, went off to the birthday celebration during working hours, and I am told at the expense of the teacher. We used to have skilled craftsmen, people building houses, masons, shoemakers, dressmakers. Well, don't try to build a house in Tobago and employ Tobago workmen. Just don't try. Everybody tells you, don't do it. Right? So we have a poor work ethic. We have undermined the reputation that we once had. And we are asking for autonomy. How is that going to work if you can't serve your own self? What is going to happen to the island's business? So this is what we have come from, from the cassava and the breadfruit. These are the things we like. These are the things we eat several times a day. And so we buy um, street foods. But OK, some of the younger people might say I'm archaic, but um, when I went to school, everybody carried their lunch. And when I started working, until I stopped in 2014, I carried my lunch to work. But people run out and buy items which are not necessarily the healthiest. And so you ain't eating breadfruit and you ain't eating cassava. You're eating more refined foods that have nice names and look, or, 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 or are thought to look more appealing. And so we have a significant increase in the prevalence of lifestyle diseases on the island. And that is enough food for thought, I would have think, thought. So we are moving away from our heritage. We are squandering it, but we have a heritage festival. Uh, I am not so sure what we are celebrating there. We have lost a sense of the significance of some of our important historical sites. I looked at last year's Heritage Festival, which ended on August the 1st. So I asked, what is happening with Emancipation Day? And I was told, sometimes Emancipation Day gets lost because of heritage. I said, what kind of wrong side story is that? Heritage was only possible because of Emancipation Day. And so you're supposed to end your heritage festival on a high on Emancipation Day. So we're going to have a young population that has little consciousness of the significance of Emancipation Day in a place where Emancipation Day celebrations was one of the first to start in 1838. So when other, in other places, when in Trinidad, there was a discussion of whether it should be celebrated at all, um, Trinidad will, people in Trinidad were articulating for government to institute it in Tobago, the people instituted it because they felt it was something to be celebrated. We had a population who, after emancipation, was deprived 
of opportunities to extend themselves to become independent. And those people worked hard, saved their monies. And as I said, some didn't succeed in the 19th century. Um, but in the 20th century, they went and they moved to Panama and uh, Cuba and United States and everywhere and scraped up the money and bought property. And a number of the property owners, certainly in Lima Tobago, acquired their properties in that way. So we had a very important property class uh, of small farmers, small landowners, um, at the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. But if you go around to the descendants of some of those now, you'll find that we have moved from landowners to landlessness or car owners. And then we have you know, um, the area, the, the old market. Now, there are several old markets in, in Tobago, and several places called old, old markets, and I think we need to address that. We could only have one old market. <clears throat> so what is James Park was a market, and they moved the market down to Wilson Road. Now, before James Park market, the market was what has been called Old Market, which was the area, now a car park, which adjoins the um, Tamron radio station. Now I hear some people calling it Tamron Square, but I don't know when it acquired the square status. But it is Old Market. <laughs> old Market is of historical significance because it was the site where captive Africans were bought and sold. Those who, most of those who came to Tobago that came through the port now, some came uh, through illegal arrangements and some were traded directly through the many bays that we have around the island. But the central point for um, admission of captive Africans during the era of the trade was in the Scarborough port and they were taken to Old Market where they were displayed for sale. In addition, this market was used as a market because many enslaved people had plots of land which they were allowed to use because the American Revolution in 1783 upset the whole trading pattern, and particularly the food supply, to the Caribbean territories. And so when they couldn't get the normal corn and saltfish and so on from the United States, the law was passed stating that every enslaved person over the age of 14 must have a plot of land to cultivate. So, Tobago had to provide its own food because it was not in the direct trading lines anyhow. So the boats would come and go everywhere else and then Tobago would get transshipped items from, um, mainly from Grenada or Barbados. So this plot of land became a source of income for enslaved people and they saved up their little pennies with the idea that at some point they would buy something that they desired and most of them sought to invest this money after 1838 in property. So Old Market was that site. So in that sense, Old Market, it was a site of the deb human um, debasement, but it was also a site of empowering because people sold in that market their produce and earned something. Because it became a large center for gatherings of enslaved people. Planters didn't like to have them gathering, but once they're there selling things, they figure they're busy. It was a point of information exchange and planning and organizing business. Maintenance of culture and cultural traditions. But also, because there were always numbers of them in the market, the planters used that as the place to teach people who needed to be taught a lesson. So it was a site of punishment. Resisting slaves were hung 
in oil market. Some were publicly beaten in oil market. So it served multiple functions during the period of enslavement. And I think that that is something that should never be lost on the population. So the undignified car park is one thing. But I feel some kind of memorial to all those who experienced oil market for trade, were killed, were hung up in the, the trees, were beaten publicly, there should be a memorial on that site. I am very pained to see. The only memorial we have from the 19th century is a memorial to the Corlanders that they set up down there. And we, our visitors go there to see that memorial. Uh, they remember with pride what they did here. We don't remember anything in pride, apparently. And then, now so, Old Market, Kyler Street. Kyler Street is named after the general who landed the English forces that took Tobago back from the French. And then if you go across, you get to the Methodist Church, which has a significant historic presence in Tobago. But around there, there was this tree that attracted children from all schools. It didn't matter, that tree was everybody's tree. The Guinea Tambran tree, that's what we call it. Everybody pelt Guinea Tambran. Now, I heard that the Guinea Tamron tree is no more. So that nobody, somebody didn't realize the significance of this tree and they cut it down. So it's one of the oldest Guinea Tamron trees we had on the island. But its real name is Baobab. And in South Africa, the Baobab tree is called the tree of life. It's a tree of life because every part of the tree has utility. You can cook the leaves, you can eat the fruit and make drink with it. Um, you can use the bark. You can build, and if the tree is big enough, uh, in rural parts of Africa, they store water in the trunk. So we have removed an item which we should have cherished. So that whole area is historic, and we have um, begun the process of destroying it. So the baobab in South Africa is now a big beauty industry. You have baobab oil, you have baobab creams of all kinds, and it is huge business. But whilst we were throwing things out, nowadays now, everybody's doing research and coming up with these great findings about these items that we have discarded. So, breadfruit, now I know poor man food, that's real healthy. So, there's a list of things stabilizing blood sugar, research at the University of the West Indies is now advocating that we eat more breadfruit and forget the white flour. Cassava, soursop, and white karate, what we used to call papa lala. Everybody knows that? No, them young people wouldn't know that. <laughs> but papalala is what some oncology doctors are recommending to cancer patients. Now, I'm sure most of us have some vine running somewhere in the, on the fence, right? And then the sour sap leaves, I remember. Those are, this is just, this is just a, a, an example. But I went a little further and looked at some of the things that we don't pay attention to. Nobody likes stinging nettle. It's a pesty plant. But here, there's a list of things that stinging nettle has been scientifically proven to be able to do. And I've listened here, circulation, detoxification, menopause, 
menopausal symptoms, menstruation, skin care, protect the kidney. Then we have Timari. Timari was a nuisance bush. Shame bush, we used to play with it as little kids, but don't walk on it barefoot. Right? Now it's, it's, male, it's a male medication. If you have um, prostate problems or prema premature ejaculation, try some Timari. But for the ladies, <laughs> but for the ladies, if the breasts kind of sagging, a pace with Timari is said to be uplifting. <laughs> so when you try, tell me. You know, so in addition to that, joint pains to take blood pressure. So we have been throwing out the baby with the bad back water when we turn our backs on the traditions. Um, the old people, the older folk knew what they were doing. I always remember as a child, there was this lady who lived like two houses up the road from us, two, maybe three on the other side of the road. And this was a lady who, when people were sick, she will boil something. So she had a kitchen outside and the kitchen, well, you know, is, 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 is an open fire, and the, the flames would be going up, and the smoke, so you had these cobwebs over the kitchen. But she would remove them. So I went there, my mother sent me there, and she was there boiling this thing, and she pulled down the cobwebs and put it in there, and I just, just got on my face, I said, oh God, is she gonna eat that? Somebody gonna drink that? Not me. Well, it turns out, cobweb, has antibiotic properties. I mean, that is established in science. So the lady was preparing her own antibiotic preparation for the sick person. But you see, we, we did, they understood something that we, the next generation, and the subsequent ones don't know. Environmental issues, when, I mean, we, we think of environmental issues when there is a natural, a natural disaster, but we must be more conscious of environmental issues all the time, and also not just look on the impact on human beings. So when we cut in a policy of how we would handle the post-disaster post situation, we need to give some consideration to the naturally occurring flora and fauna, in particular, on the island. We need to look closely at what was, or more closely at what happened in the rainforest. After the rainforest, there was a lot of talk about the Coquico, which came out. We are not sure what happened to other species inside. And that needs to be brought to the attention of the general population. I know the larger animal population has dwindled, but is there a balance? I mean, even things like Worms and flies, you know, uh, and, and uh, uh, the other end of the, the ecology chain. You need to look at those to see if the supply is balanced or if some, some species uh, um, have been depleted and others have grown much more significantly and the whole ecological balance of the rainforest is upset. Uh, we use it to reflect on the larger Tobago question. Well, the bird has migrated and the people have migrated. What do we do with people who migrate in? Now, when you read a newspaper which tells you X person was apprehended for an attack on visitors and the person come from Aruka, Maloney, or some other place, uh, we have to look at how people with um, non-approved practices come into our space. Uh, when, when, when that event happened, I remember trying to take a taxi to go down to the airport, and it was a PH taxi, and the fellow didn't seem to know where he's going. So I said, but how long are you doing this? Oh, I just come up. 
So we have people who just come up. My brother said he took a taxi when he tell his son to drop in Darrell Spring Road. He didn't know where Darrell Spring Road. He said, but that's in town. How, how we don't know? Yeah, because some people come up here, like when they have um, long weekends and when they have <laughs> where they have some who run from the law, who some come to make a quick change, you know. So when you have any festival and your people will be around, you come up and you run a little pH. But we need to look at that. We, we have to have some kind of systems where people are not allowed to come and spoil the reputation of the island. So at the end of it all, we have two national problems. The bird, Tobago. So whither goeth the Coprico and whither goeth Tobago? Well, the Coprico are not going anywhere. So we need to have a policy. Exactly what should we do? Should people be pelting Coprico and chasing them out of the yards or giving them corn soaking rum? I hear they, they refuse that. They don't, they don't touch that at all. So, 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 so the bottom. That one I'm working. <laughs> they're, they're responding better if you're violent, if you try to strike them, right? So we have to, we have to deal with that. And also, when the bird comes into your yard, if, even if, if you, you accept the bird, how is it relating to the chickens and the cat or dog or other things that you might have in the yard? We need to give some thought there. Now, in my view, the Coprico should be, well, two things should happen. They should attempt to increase the food store and increase the bird population in the green forest. There are some birds there, few. Put, plant some whatever that they like to eat so that that population could grow. So you'll always have a, a wild population. Those that in town, them ain't going back. So you could create a bird sanctuary in Tobago West, and in that sanctuary you plant stuff that they would eat and be attracted in that area and away from the, the food sources of that, that, that hardworking farmers are trying to establish. That's how I think they might attempt to solve the problem. Tobago. The autonomy issue needs to be settled. I understand that the committee that was set up has some problems. They can't understand, understand this, that, or the other. Even though they have called in people to give explanations, I was called in to give an outline of the history. Other people went in to give various outlines as well, but they still can't come to a decision. At the same time, Tobago needs to look at itself. You need to consider how each individual could drive the island forward. If we are to have development, we have to have people who are committed, people who work, people who are reliable. One of the things that we have to look at is our heritage. I don't think anything that anybody inherits should allow that item or those items to be lost. And so we must value the effort that people who went before us put into providing us with the base that allows us to claim Tobago as ours. And that is your little piece of land. So even if you, if you sell it and you buy a car, you have nothing. Land doesn't rot. It appreciates. The car depreciates from the time you come out of the showroom. If you bought it, and if it's a second hand, well, worse, it already depreciated way beyond what you pay for it. So as they say, what once I was and what I'm now. We've got to look at that. If we change into far, how would we resolve it? A law, no law can change to be good. They could bring all the corruption laws they want. You 
have to make the change within you. And so what might help us most in the long run is go back to some of our traditions which can possibly help us to get where we want to be. I thank you. Thank you.